Hey guys, what is up? Super K Man Rocks here, and I'm back for something a little different, just a tad bit different. Uh, as you guys know, there was a pretty big break for Riot. Riot Games went on a break, which meant no LCS, no LEC for an entire weekend. That meant uh, usually you'd not be seeing a video here on Thursday, but uh, I had an idea. Uh, I thought it would be interesting to use this break to kind of give a little bit of a detailed breakdown of my player rankings because I didn't actually do those before the start of the summer split. The last time we did any player rankings was, of course, before spring, and quite a bit has changed since then. So I thought, why not? Let's go ahead and do these videos as kind of an update. All of these will be coming out within the next few days. Of course, uh, these will be replacing, the, the Western videos will be replacing uh, the Western region videos that normally would be up the recap video since they didn't play. Uh, the Eastern regions, the LCK and the LPL, uh, will probably be up sometime around the weekend, but we will be getting those as well. But I hope you guys are excited, because I know I am, uh, you know, kind of give you my updates and my thoughts on where some of these teams are at. If you guys are excited and are interested in this kind of video, please, uh, let me know down in the comment section below. Obviously, you know I love chatting it up with you guys, so if you have any suggestions for, uh, how this series can go, uh, I've changed up the format a little bit, at least visually, uh, with the help of some of the people that are helping me work on these videos. Thank you to you, by the way. Um, yeah, uh, we changed up the format a little bit. If you guys like it, let me know. Uh, if you don't, if you if you want to see something different, let me know that as well, because we can make both work. So, um, let's go ahead. I don't want to waste too much time. We're already almost two minutes into this intro. We're going to be doing this in order of my current power rankings. So, uh, if you don't know what my power rankings are, they are, uh, I have a series here where after every week I review all the games and I update my power rankings. We will be going from the end here of week three. That was the last week that we got in the LEC. And uh, so we're going to be going from the end of that with my power rankings. So let's not waste too much time. Let's jump right into my number 10 ranked team here. Uh, and number 10 for me is going to be BDS. Team BDS, they currently look like the worst team in the LEC right now. It's definitely contested, but uh, they're definitely one of the bottom two and... As you can see from my player rankings, it's pretty clear why. They don't really have a superstar player. The closest thing they have to that, in my opinion, is Synchroff in the jungle, who I do think has shown flashes of being a pretty good LEC player, but certainly not to the level where you can carry a bad team to being relevant. Um, we're going to go ahead and go over uh, their lineup, I should say, uh, if, if you don't already know, is going to be Aggressive U in the top lane, Synchroff in the jungle, Nuclear Ant in the mid lane, x Maddie at AD Carry, and then Erdot at support. Um, yeah, they just, it doesn't inspire a lot of confidence just from a player perspective. Obviously, I was a lot higher on this roster going into spring. Uh, Adam was coming off of a pretty good year with Fnatic. Yes, he showed his ups and downs, but he was coming off of a good year. I was much higher on x Maddie than I think a lot of people were. I was high on Synchroff and x Maddie. Uh, I thought both of them would be able to make the transition to the LEC a little bit easier, and then uh, I was pretty high on Limit. Uh, when they came in. Obviously, definitely some changes here. Uh, let's start in the top lane with Aggressive U because he's difficult to talk about. He's someone who I've actually been a fan of for quite a while. I thought last year that uh, Misfits would have been... It would have been an interesting Misfits team if they had called him up to play instead of Hirit. Um, Hirit had some good games here or there, but I thought Aggressive U was overall more consistent. He finally gets his LEC opportunity here on BDS, and it's a little unfortunate because I'm just not exactly sure that he... Is really given a lot of room to succeed here. Um, there is certainly not a ton of talent around him, and top lane already is a really difficult role to win from. Not that he's been fantastic, but I think his ceiling might be a little bit higher than what he is showing on this roster. Uh, unfortunately, I I'm not sure he's going to be able to, to, to hit that here. Like I said, Synchroff in the jungle is probably the highlight for me. Uh, he's probably the best player on the team. And uh, he really has, when they win, it's because of him. He's really been the one to carry this BDS team. Uh, he has really good early pathing. He can sometimes struggle, though, in the late game to translate that. I'm not sure how much of that is the fact that he doesn't have a ton of winning lanes, and he just does a really good job at skirmishing in the early to mid game. But uh, either way, it's definitely something to be concerned about, but it's still a positive. Uh, I, I, you know, I still think they found a diamond in the rough here and, and someone I would expect them to be looking to build around over the next few years. Uh, you have Nuclear in the mid lane here, really the only carryover from the former Shulka roster, Shulka Nefir roster that they bought out, but I don't know. Nuclear has really taken a nosedive for me this year. Uh, he was not good in spring. 
uh, and he's been arguably worse here in summer. Uh, he's very quickly, I think, become one of the worst mid laners in the LEC. Uh, not that he was ever, like, phenomenal, but I know there was a lot of upside and a lot of potential for Nuclear Ant. I just don't think on this team that he's going to be able to unlock that at all. Uh, and then you're looking at the it, what is, in my estimation, the worst bot lane in the LEC. x Maddie has really disappointed expectations. I really liked the way x Maddie played in, uh, in uh, EU Masters, but he just has not been able to make that transition at all to the LEC stage, which is really disappointing because he was someone that, you know, like I said, I had a lot of promise and, and hope for. Air Dot I wasn't as familiar with, but I went back to I bet I went back and watched some of his tape and he's fine. Really, he's not great. Um I don't see uh, X Maddie would have to get back into form for me to really believe that this is some sort of bot lane that could turn into like a top I don't know, like like I don't know, like a top seven, top six bot lane. That like X Maddie's really gonna have to be the one to carry that, and right now he just doesn't even look like he's prepared to not be the worst uh, ADC in in the LEC. So really, really tough outlook there. As obviously you can see why I think this BDS team is is towards the bottom of my rankings because they just have so many question marks and so many things that uh, I I don't like about them. You know, obviously they have some upside. I think Aggressive is a good player that, if given the opportunity, could be a, a pretty okay LEC top laner. I really do like Synchroff, uh, but everybody else on this team, I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not sold on. So for now, they're going to land here at, at 10. Um, if you wanted to flip them up to 9, I understand. We'll talk about who I have at 9 later, but uh, for me, this, this roster is the worst in Europe. That's going to bring us to our number nine team in the power rankings, the second to bottom team here. And for me, that is going to be SK Gaming. Uh, if you wanted to put SK bottom, I totally understand. Uh, for me, BDS has been a little worse. Obviously, SK beat BDS, but BDS also beat G2, so what do I know? Um, <laughs> but yeah, SK is whatever, right? Like, they're fine. Uh, let's go over their roster here. It's gonna be Genax in the top lane, Gilius in the jungle, Certus in the mid lane, Jezu at AD carry, and then Treats at support. Uh, they definitely have some talent. Um, not just, like, yeah, I think they have a little bit more talent, if you want to put it that way, than someone like, uh, BDS, than a team like BDS that we just talked about. Uh, I really like Certus in the mid lane. I think he's someone that you can really do stuff with. Unfortunately, mid lane's a really tough position to break out in in the LEC because there are seven, you know, relatively all pro caliber mid laners in the LEC. Uh, for what it's worth, I think Certus is the best of that group, of the group right below uh, the all pro candidates, you know, right below Nuke Duck, I have him. But yeah, I think uh, he's probably the, the player you're most excited about here as an SK fan. Really was known as an assassin player in EU Masters and has kind of grown a little bit out of that. Obviously, he's still much better on his LeBlancs, his Akalis, but uh, has definitely grown in the ability to play some more supportive picks. We've seen the Lissandra in recent weeks. We saw the Orianna a lot in spring. So picks like that, I definitely think he's getting a lot more comfortable on, which raises the ceiling for what he can be for this team. But he's definitely a carry-oriented player and someone that I would expect this team to play around a lot more. Um, another positive, quote-unquote, for this team, I think is Jezu. He's like an inconsistent, this bot lane in general, I think they're an inconsistent positive. They show signs of being good. And they also show a lot of signs of being, like, not good. I don't think they're one of the best bot lanes in Europe by any means, but um, they have games where they're the focal point for this SK team, and they can win in the LEC because of that, which I, you know, say what you want about some other players in the league. I'm not sure everybody has that ability, to kind of be the focal point of a roster and still be able to win games because of it. Um, I was much better on Treats coming into the year than I am now. I think he had a really poor spring, uh, but I don't want that to distract from the fact that I actually think he had a really good 2021. Um, so, you know, maybe he bounces back here. I obviously think it was a mistake to stay on SK Gaming if he did have offers from other teams, including North American teams, uh, because this, this organization seems a little disastrous right now, but... I think him and Jezu have some level of upside. Do I think they're going to hit it? Probably not. But at least it's something to look forward to. Where I don't think you have a ton of upside is the top side of this team. Uh, Genax and Gilius. I, I know Genax is ranked the highest, quote-unquote, of any players on this team. That's because top lane is a very 
uh, shallow role in the LEC. Really, if you want to put the bottom four top laners in any order that you want, Gen X, Aggressive Ooh, and then two that we'll talk about later, uh, I totally wouldn't, I, like, take your pick. Like, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, I think, realistically, you could put them in any order, and I would be totally okay with it. Uh, Gen X just, for me, gets the nod at the top of that list because of his experience. Uh, he at least has been able to show that he can be on a team that is winning. Uh, which I don't think any of the other three have shown, at least in recent memory. So, yeah, Gen X hits the seven mark. He's fine. He's he's such a nothing in the top lane. He's not really going to win or lose you games. He's there. Uh, Gilius, however, in the jungle has been a huge hindrance for this team. They brought him in after, you know, he had the miracle run a couple of years ago on Schalke, uh, gets the full-time starting spot. They are a huge disappointment the year after. He gets replaced and comes over here to SK, and he has just been bad. Like, there's no other way to put it. He's easily been the worst jungler in the LEC since joining SK Gaming. He's arguably been the worst player in the LEC in Summer Split. Um, I don't see that turning around anytime soon. He has a very aggressive play style, but at the same time, he's not exactly super gank-focused, which means it's really hard for his laners to get a ton of advantages if he is... Like, he's a high-resource player, uh, but also a low resource player in the sense that the resources aren't distributed really at all when it comes to Gilius. So I don't know. I don't really see a lot of upside to keeping him on the team. I would expect him to honestly get replaced. And I know Gilius getting replaced again. Like I almost feel bad at that point, but like, I just don't really see a reason to keep him on the team. He doesn't have the upside to make this team better. And really he's just making them worse at the moment. So, um, yeah, that's the outlook on SK. Uh, do I think that like, what's their ceiling? I don't know. Like eight, nine like like I said I really think the bottom two teams are like the bottom two teams I think there is a very big gap between you know even seven and eight and and nine and ten and SK gaming just happens to fall in that nine and ten I really don't see them even remotely coming close to a playoff berth or 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 even assuming they could I think really this year should be about seeing what you have in your young players like Certus and Jezu uh understanding if you want to keep around someone like Treats and maybe even Gen X, and then, you know, I, I would hope at some point they would move on and, and, and try to develop a young jungler here, but, uh, yeah, this, this, the upside for this team isn't quite there, but I think they're just that tad bit better than BDS, so they end up here at 9. Moving on to number 8 here in the power rankings, and it's a team that I really want to have higher than 8, but unfortunately, I couldn't quite fit it in. It's gonna be Astralis, uh, they're gonna fall here to 8, um, not that they've fallen or risen since last week. I just mean, uh, they've looked pretty good this year. At times I've considered them part of the top six and at other times, you know, not at all, but they've honestly looked much, much improved with this new roster. So let's talk about it. They've got Vizichachi in the top lane, Xerxe in the jungle, Dior in the mid lane, Kabe at AD carry and Jung Hoon at support. Um, let's talk about the positives to this team and pretty much all of that is going to come out of the bot lane. Jung Hoon, their mid season signing here has been phenomenal. I did not see this coming. He comes from a bro challenger, a Fred Breon challengers team that was not good. Um, and it, I went back and watched some of his challengers games and he certainly did not show the explosiveness and the willingness to fight that he does in the LEC. I'm not sure if it's a team thing or, or what it is, but he's been very active in a good way. Um, his signature pike pick has already come out a couple times and he looks really good on it. We've seen him on the Seraphine. This is a huge bright spot for Astralis and he's a big reason why I almost want to put this team in the playoffs because he is a playoff caliber support. Someone you can really build a really strong bot lane around. If he had more success, he might even be higher than five here, but, uh, five is about as high as I could put him, uh, considering he's only played, you know, not even half a split in, uh, in the LEC so far, but that's not to say Kabe is a slouch. Obviously, Kabe has some history. He's certainly on the, the downturn, I think, of his career. He's not the peak Kabe where he would have been in the 1, 2, 3 range for LEC 80 carries. He's not that anymore. He's still good, though. Uh, definitely someone you can win with at the 80 carry position when you have a, a support like Jung Hoon. They seem to have some pretty good chemistry, so I think they're going to be happy with Kabe here. He does a lot of the shot calling from what I hear. Him and Jung Hoon do a lot of the communication as well, so I think that's a positive. Um, but this team certainly isn't lacking in veteran experience, <laughs> um, which you can tell from the top side of this, uh, this team here. They bring Chachi in. Uh, I want to say good things about Chachi because I really do like Visa Chachi. Obviously, he was so good back in the day, but, oh, right now he's just not doing it. He has been the worst top laner in the LEC so far in Summer Split. 
I honestly don't know if it's been like super close. I want to imagine he gets better. He, he at the very least has been the worst laner. I don't really think that's entirely disputable. He still has some good team fight mechanics and he plays tanks really well. I think that's definitely his sweet spot is, uh, is on tanks, on Sejuani, on Orn, things like that. I expect him to be on that for most of the rest of the season, but man, his laning stats are bad and, and it shows on tape. It's not just a stats thing. So, uh, definitely not a lot of upside in the top lane because it's not like Chachi's going to be getting a lot better, um, or at least you wouldn't expect him to. Uh, you bring Xerxes in here, obviously spent some time on Immortals in North America, comes back here to play for Astralis. He was actually, like, underratedly good last year in 2021 for Immortals. I uh, had a really bad spring split as that entire team did. Uh, he moves back here to Europe, gets on this Astralis team, and has looked fine to start this year. He's kind of the jungler that the most epitomizes, like, doesn't win you the game, doesn't lose you the game in this region. I think he is someone who is there when they're winning, he's going to look good, and when they lose, he's going to look bad. Like, he is exactly what the rest of this team's output can be. If he can link up with Jong Hoon and be a little bit more proactive, because that's really what I want to see out of him. I, I want to, I'm tired of him farming until 20 minutes, and then just trying to take over late. Um, if, if he has a little bit more impact on the early game, maybe a lot more impact, you know, Jung Hoon loves these champions that can be super versatile and roam a lot early, and Kabe's not a bad weak side player, if you want to play around that, maybe go mid lane, try to make some plays happen a little bit more, I'm certainly not going to complain, but that just isn't Xerxes play style, and, and we've seen that pretty clearly now. As for Dior in the mid lane, I know I have him as the worst ranked mid laner, obviously mid lane is like the most competitive uh, <laughs> position at, you know, in the LEC by far. Um, I wouldn't take these numbers too, too seriously. I know I usually do this disclaimer at the beginning, but sometimes a 10 in a position can be a better player than like a seven or an eight in another. Like I would argue that Dior at 10 is better than Gen X, who is seven in top lane for SK, but, uh, you know, mid lane's just tougher. There's better mid laners. So to say Dior is the worst sucks, but you know, he's just not quite there yet. His call up was definitely premature. We were talking about that at the beginning of the year as well. Obviously, he's had so little. He's basically played professional. Before he played for Astralis, he had basically played professionally for three months, and he was given an LEC spot, and he shows it. He certainly lacks in macro decisions sometimes, and he definitely has to learn how to not play as the main resource carry, but uh, he's gotten a little bit better. He's gotten a little bit more comfortable. I just certainly don't know if he's ready enough, even at this point, to play in the LEC. He could definitely use with some more time, I think, on a sister team or a B team, an EU Masters team, uh, to just get more comfortable with playing within a team and to get that macro sense that I think you really only get in the pro, you know, system because the pro games are just not solo queue. Like, if you're not familiar with how these games go and how you need to play them, it's going to be really difficult. It's not something you just immediately translate. So, um, hopefully he can get some more time. I He just hasn't been good. There's really no other way to put it. Uh, he, he gets gapped by pretty much every mid laner in the game. He loses them games sometimes, and I can't remember the last time he was a reason they won. He can be a success in, in the LEC. I just, I don't think it's going to happen this year. As for the outlook of the team, though, um, like I said, I do think this team has, like, top six potential, uh, mostly because this bot lane has just been very, very good. If they continue onward with that trend, I can see them, you know, pushing. I don't think Xerxes is someone that's going to hold you back. Chachi on tanks is fine. Dior can play, uh, especially control mages. It's just about whether or not you get the consistency out of him. Like, for them to be better than, like, Vitality or Misfits, like, I could see it happening. I just, I don't think I'm going to predict that. Um, right now, it's really just about Jung Hoon making flashy plays and the rest of the team not being able to win because of them. That's going to bring us to our number seven team in the power rankings, our final non-playoff team in terms of power rankings. And that, for me, is Misfits Gaming. Uh, Misfits is a really interesting roster, mostly because it is one really phenomenal, like genuinely top tier player and four players that shouldn't even be sniffing the playoffs, honestly. Um, so let's talk about it. Their roster is looking like irrelevant in the top lane, Schlatan in the jungle, VTO in the mid lane, Neon at 80 carry and Mursa at support. Uh, VTO is really good, huh? <laughs> I mean, this team was like VTO and four wards and they made playoffs. They were like top four last split. Um, he really is that good. He won MVP for a reason. Uh, a lot of people might be mad that I have him as my number two mid laner. He's struggled. Like, I don't, I don't want to oversell it, but the first week of games, 
in the LEC. We only have three weeks to work on in spring. In week one, he was probably the worst player in the LEC. Like, he really was not good. He's clearly bounced back in weeks two and three. But it's just a little bit concerning. I don't think I have that same kind of question mark about number one. And I'm going to be honest, even if this was before that performance, I still might have had him at number two because we'll, we'll get to number one later. But uh, yeah, I still think VTO's phenomenal. Like, he is a he is a player that can take four lower tier players and, and bring them to the playoffs. Like, he is, he is that good. There are not a lot of players in the world that I think have that level of carry in them. But VTO definitely is that. I don't really have a lot of negatives to say about him. He's pretty much the perfect young mid laner. And if they get talent around him, I expect to be I expect him to be a world's fixture for, for many, many years. Uh, if they can just surround him with a good roster. But let's talk about the rest here. The other member of this uh, roster I'm, I'm relatively high on is Neon. I was much higher on Neon coming into the year than I am now. I think he's had an up and down year. When he wins, he wins hard. Like, he's a good player. Uh, I think him and Kabe are actually relatively close in skill level. I would I would put them, you know, if you want to flip them at 7 and 8, like, I totally understand that. Um, but the problem with Neon is he just doesn't consistently win lane. Um, if he wins lane, he usually translates that really well into doing a lot of damage late game, but uh, his laning stats aren't the best, and he's just not the most consistent. His champion pool can also be a little limited at times. Uh, that's kind of AD carry in general. Uh, most AD carries have their preferences and, and champs they don't like as much, but uh, for Neon, I think it's a little more apparent. Uh, I'm not sure Mercer helps him out a ton. I think Mercer has definitely been not a negative, but definitely not a positive for this Misfits team since joining. I was certainly surprised when Mercer got the nod here on Misfits at the beginning of the year, and he really hasn't proven to be anything like substantial or game changing yet. And you know, if he can become that great, I don't think that's in the cards. Uh, he just looks like one of the bottom tier LEC supports. And I think you could say the same thing about both top and jungle. Uh, both of them, I would consider relatively low tier uh, in their roles. Uh, Schlatan in the jungle, I think, has his moments where he looks really good. Most of them are because him and VTO are linking up and just traversing the map as a 2v2. And they win a lot of 2v2s. That's really been a game plan that Misfits has taken advantage of is... The 2v2 between Schlatan and VTO and then anybody else. And Mercer does a lot of roaming as well. Like, a lot of playing around VTO this team does. Why did I say that like Yoda? <laughs> um, but that's where Schlatan is at his best when he can kind of play proactively with his mid laner as more of a supportive jungler. Um, we knew him as much more of a resource carry in E-Masters, but he's kind of turned that around. He's been alright. I just don't see him as someone who, if he didn't have a player like VTO in the mid lane, I doubt we would be thinking he's... Uh, you know, like a top tier jungler or anything like that. I think a lot of his success does come from the fact that he has one of the best mid laners in the world on his team. Uh, and then you have a relevant in the top lane. I'm not sure why you would choose that name for your, I mean, I get it. You're a top laner and it is kind of prudent, especially in this meta, how top lane can be a little bit of a difficult position to carry on if you're not, I don't know, Kale, but um, irrelevance fine. Like he, he is almost exactly what you, what, what like BDS has in aggressive U or SK has in Gen X, right? In the sense of he's in the top lane and he'll probably lose by 10 CS and not die a ton in lane. And you just kind of want him to be there in late game team fights. He's not going to swing your team one way or the other. He is just how you say irrelevant <laughs> in most games. At least that's what I've seen from him so far. I think Gen X and Aggressive who have a little bit more potential to like actually win lane and, and progress, at least from what I've seen. So they're going to be a little bit higher, but it's not like irrelevance like, that much worse or even worse at all than them. I just, I think Gen X and Aggressive have a higher potential. So Irrelevant falls here at number nine. As for the outlook of, of Misfits, they're a good team. I mean, we know they're a good team. They were playoffs last year with, uh, or last split with just a different top laner. But um, I really don't, I don't know if I trust that to happen again. They fall in that seven category mostly because Schlatan, Neon, Mercer, Irrelevant, like it's one of the weaker supporting casts in the LEC. It really, really is. The only thing that would tell you this is even remotely a team that should be contending for playoffs is VTO in the mid lane, and he is that good. But currently, I don't know if I, I, I certainly I don't know if his shoulders are heavy enough, are are strong enough to carry how heavy the rest of this team is right now. So I, I'm just gonna predict them to be just outside that top six, which I feel is pretty strong right now. But you know, with VTO, honestly, if, if this team did make it and they surprised, um, you you can't even say that you'd be shocked just because of how good that player is. 
All right, now we are ready to talk about our playoff teams or my projected playoff teams in the LEC for Summer Split here. Starting off with the bottom of them, in my opinion, being Team Vitality. Uh, this was a team that I had number one in my spring preseason predictions, and that has aged like milk. Um, not that I was the only one. I don't know anybody who had them below their top two. Um, this team has just underperformed a lot of expectations. Let's go over their roster. They've got Alfari in the top lane, Haru in the jungle, uh, you know, a little aside to Bo, which we'll talk about, but uh, Perks in the mid lane, Karzi at AD carry, and Lebrov at support. Um, this team's just kind of meh, right? Like, they have some really good, and their talent, I, I should say before I talk about anything, the talent level of this team is so high. There was a reason everybody thought they were going to be world beaters at the beginning of the year, one of the best teams in the world, but there are also clear reasons why they are not that, and we will get into that later, but one player who I think really hasn't like, lowered expectations. Maybe he has a little, but not by too much, is Perks in the mid lane. He's actually been really, really solid this year, especially in summer. Uh, he started to tail off towards the end of spring, but uh, I think in summer, with some renewed confidence, he's actually been this team's best player by a lot. Um, and, you know, he's got... You know, I can go over the stats. He's got the best mid lane stats in pretty much every category for in lane, like CSD at 10, uh, goal... Um, uh, I'm trying to think of what else. Gold difference, right? Like... Um, his, his stats are phenomenal. He is clearly one of the better mid laners in the league. And just, it, it's hard for this team to translate that into anything late game, which we'll talk about. I think that's not, you know, it's not, not to say it's not Perks' problem, but just, um, I don't know. This team has a problem after 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, the brain of this team turns off. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with their jungle. Haru right now, we'll talk about Bo a little bit here after, but Haru comes in. He's fine. You know, obviously former top player in the LCK, played in EU Masters for a split, and here we are. Um, he's fine. He's not like a super plus. He's not a super minus. Uh, on it, when, when he when he wins, he does win. Um, that's a plus. Uh, but he's definitely a, like a high resource jungle that I just don't think this team is in a position to be able to accommodate. Uh, you really want to hope that Haru can be lower resource than something like than someone like Self Made was, but uh, Haru is really. You know, if you go back to look at the history of Haru, he's always been best when he's the best player on the team. And that's just not the case here. Um, he's not that talent level anymore, at least, you know, in terms of where the LEC is at. So, you know, like I said, when he wins, he wins hard. When he loses, he loses pretty hard as well. So uh, pretty uh, volatile there in the jungle. Another volatile player is Alfari in the top lane. Let's talk about it. Um, blah, ah, this was, he has all the talent in the world to be the best top laner in the world. Like, he really does. His laning is unparalleled when he's at his best. He can turn those, uh, you know, advantages into late game successes, like on Gangplank, on these champions that he's much more familiar on. He knows how to obliterate people late game. He knows how to split push. Like, he really doesn't do anything particularly wrong. He just sometimes doesn't show up. Like, in summer, that's kind of... It, it was all, pretty much all of spring and all of summer so far. He's just not shown up. Um, and I don't really know what it is. He looks worse than not only he did on Team Liquid, not only than he did on Origin or Misfits or anything like that. Like, I, I think this is the worst we've seen Alfari in his career on this team, which is a really bad sign. It's something you really don't want to say because he really should be in his prime right here. But just just unfortunately disappointing. Hopefully he can get back on track, but I really have nothing else to say about Alfari. He has everything he needs in order to be the best top laner in the world, and he just, for some reason, it just does not come together on this team. But uh, let's talk about the bottom lane. Karzi and Lebrov. I was much higher on Karzi going into the year. Turns out, a lot of Karzi's success was Kaiser. I'm not saying it was all Kaiser, because Karzi really has that sense of play style to him that I think if he didn't have that, he wouldn't have succeeded on Mad Lions like he did. Uh, he's very aggressive, and that can really work when you have a ridiculously mechanically talented support to back it up. Lebrov just isn't that guy. Lebrov is not Kaiser. And that's not to say Lebrov is bad. I think they're both good players. They're just not great players. They are solid, aggressive bot laners. And, you know, on this team that plays really aggro already, they fit in, but also they can lose this team. Karzi has lost this team games. Just like Alfari's lost his team games, just like, you know, Selfmade did in spring and Haru has done in summer, uh, they play too aggro, like, they don't have anybody on this team to be the constant. That has relatively been perks, 
but Perks will have one or two moments every game, especially after 25 or 30 minutes, where he just, like, dies in a side lane for no reason. And it's like, well, what's the point of you having all the gold if you're going to do this every single game? So, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, this team just is so inconsistent. Well, I, could, I should say they're consistent in the fact that you know that any expectation for them is irrelevant because they're going to play their game and the way they play no matter what. Uh, with Bo, I don't think he'll be here this year. Uh, that was kind of the big reason no North American team signed him in spring was because uh, there was just the expectation that Bo was not going to be able to make it out of China uh, within the year of 2022. But if he does come, I think he's going to be better. He's another high-resource player. Shout out. So, it, you know, you add him in. He's more mechanically talented than Haru, but I don't actually think he's going to change the fortunes of this team that much. So uh, for all the play, you know, all the fans hoping for Bo to come in and fix all the problems, he feels very much more like a self-made uh, than he does anything else. So, you know, shout out. If it comes in and it works, great. And I look like an idiot, great. I, I'm more than happy to be proven wrong about that. I just, I don't anticipate it. As for the outlook of this team, until they can find any level of consistency, they're going to be the bottom of this like upper echelon of teams. I actually think they are the divider. I think top five on any day can like win any game. And I think bottom, then I think you have like Misfits and Astralis, I should say. And then you have SK and BDS. I think Vitality are like in a tier of their own, just kind of in the middle. Um, they're not perfect. They're not bad. They're going to beat the bad teams. They're going to lose to the good teams. They're the median. And, and I think they, they do that job well here at six. Moving into my number five team in the power rankings here, we've got the Mad Lions. I think this is almost exactly where I expected them to be at this point in the year, but for almost entirely different reasons. <laughs> so let's go over what their roster is looking like. It's looking like Arma in the top lane, El Yoya in the jungle, Niski here in the mid lane, Unforgiven at 80 carry, and Kaiser at support. Obviously, the addition of Niski here in the mid lane at the beginning of Summer Split has proven to be a fruitful one for Mad Lions as he has been really the central player that this Mad Lions team likes to focus through. Not because he's the carry, but more so because wherever Niski is, uh, he's going to be the one facilitating the carry. Um, very similar to, I think, how a lot of LPL junglers play um, in the sense of they don't need all the gold, but they're still the focal point, right? Like wherever they are, that's where the game is taking place, but... Yeah, I mean, shout out Niski. He's been a great addition. Uh, I have him as my fourth mid laner here. I think if you would have asked me that before summer started, I would have had him as low as probably six. I don't think I would have had him at seven, but probably as low as six on my power rankings. He's just had such a phenomenal start to the year that he's leapfrogged a few a few people that we're going to talk about later um, to become, you know, one of the top mid laners in the region. Um, he's not the only good player on this team, though. Not even close. Let's talk about the bot lane. They are really good. Um, I think Unforgiven is better than Karzy ever was, at least in terms of, like, carry potential. He's really the funnel point of this uh, Mad Lions team. Like I said, I think Niski and El Yoya are the focal points, but Unforgiven's, like, the funnel point. Like, he's the one who is going to be getting all of those supportive resources that they want to dump into. And Kaiser does such a great job of setting him up with that. I'm pretty convinced at this point that Kaiser is the best support in the West. Um, you know... You want to do Kaiser versus Core JJ. Core JJ's had a little bit of a down year. Kaiser's that guy. Like, Kaiser really has become the best support in the West. I don't even think it's really that debatable anymore. He has made every AD carry he's ever played with look like money. And that includes Unforgiven. And I'm not, you know, I, I try to factor that into Unforgiven's rating here. Because, you know, it, it's hard to put someone who plays with Kaiser as high as three when we've seen someone look like that. But, you know, you know, look like Karzy did like last year or so. But... Man, Unforgiven's so mechanically talented that I have to imagine that he'd be pretty high on this list, even without one of the best supports in the game. I think having the best support in the game just makes it easier for him. So, yeah, this is a really, really solid bot lane. And, and theoretically, Unforgiven should only get better. Obviously, this is his rookie year, so hopefully he only gets better. Then you have El Yoya in the jungle. I still consider him one of the top two junglers in the LEC. Some people are going to be really mad with how I rank the junglers here. Uh, some people are going to have, uh, you know, a much different order than I am, but... This is what I ended up settling on. Elioy is just hyper consistent. Obviously, he's better at certain picks than others. He's really good at heavy engage AD champs. We've seen Lee Sin, you know, Wukong, etc. Those kinds of champs, I think, are certainly where Elioy is at his best at, but it's definitely not all that he can play. He's just very, very consistently great. He syncs up with Niski pretty much perfectly. Like, I couldn't imagine a better jungle mid synergy start than, like, what we've seen out of these two at the beginning of Summer Split. They just look... 
pretty completely in sync, and I expect that to continue throughout the year. Them supporting that bot lane has been a huge, huge plus for Mad Lions, and that's really where a lot of the excitement of this team comes through, is the fact that you have a player like Oyoya and a player like Niski, and they can make trips to help out a player like Kaiser in getting a player like Unforgiven super duper fed and just letting him carry the game. So yeah, I, I really like the way that's set up. One concern I do have for this team is the top lane. Armut's in the top lane, and this is something I probably wouldn't have said at the beginning of the year, but Armut's had a pretty bad 2022, like, secretly. he's He's been very, very overrated in terms of how he's actually produced this year. That's not to say he's a bad player, but I don't know. He has certainly lost his fair share of games for this Mad Lions team, not only in spring, but summer so far as well. So I'm definitely a little lower on Armut. That's not to say he's not still one of the top five top laners in the region. I just don't know if he's quite as close to that top upper echelon as he probably would have been at the beginning of the year. He, for me, has taken a few steps back in terms of how I would power rank him uh, overall, but I don't think it really hurts Mad Lions as a unit. Like I said, they're very strong. I think the top five are really interchangeable. They, unfortunately, fall at the bottom of that top five. We've seen them beat better teams, but we've also seen them lose to worse teams. I really think it's just about how can Niski get across, get around and across the map? And can he do it with El Yoya? If the answer to that is yes, I really think they can beat anybody in the region. But if the answer to that is no, they have the chance to lose to teams like Misfits. I think they already have. Or, moose, or lose to Astralis, right? Like, they, uh, they aren't going to be, a, they're going to be a team that relies on their game plan. And if they get that game plan taken away from them, it definitely can be a lot more difficult. So something to look out for there with Mad Lions. But overall, still a very good team. Uh, still in that, what I consider the upper echelon of LEC teams, uh, just for me, uh, not quite at the same level as the top four. Moving on to our number four team in the power rankings. That, of course, is going to be Rogue. Uh, Rogue coming in at four, I think a lot of people might want them a little higher. Some people might even want them lower. I don't know. Having them above Mad Lions feels right, but... Um, their lineup going into, you know, this upcoming week of the LEC is Odo Omne in the top lane, Maorang in the jungle, Larson in the mid lane, Comp at 80 carry, and then Trimby at support. It's a good lineup. Uh, they perform better than they look on paper, though. They really, really do. Uh, some people might be mad with how low I have some of their players, but really, at the end of the day, this team outperforms their individual skill level, in my opinion. Uh, let's talk about their best player, in my opinion, and I think in everybody's opinion, Odo Omne who really is phenomenal. He is probably the perfect top laner for the modern game in the fact that he can carry without resources, he's good with resources, and he's really good weak side as well. He's really good with resources of the other team dumped into him. He's very good at playing safe, and he's very good at knowing when to be aggressive. He's just one of the perfect top laners you could have right now. He's very close to being my number one ranked top laner in the LEC, just barely edged out by a player we'll name later, but... Uh, yeah, him at number two, I think, is 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 a testament to how good he really is. Um, I think another, you know, the, the, where we start to talk about players that I think a lot of people are going to say are underrated by me, we start with Maorang here at number five. He was certainly not the fifth best jungler in the LEC in spring. He was much, much better than that. However, he did start to underperform in the playoffs. And his summer hasn't exactly been like gangbusters good like it was in spring. Uh, the top four of the jungle position are very difficult to break into, in my opinion. I think all four of them have a case to be made to be, I don't know, the best or one of the best junglers in the region. Malrang just unfortunately happens to be right below them, in my opinion. Not to say that he's a bad player. Not to say he's even not like a B plus or whatever, right? Like he's he's just a, he's good. He's not someone that if you put on the best team in the world, he's going to be a carry and get you there no matter what. He's someone that will make your team better if you have very good players, which is exactly what he does on this roster. They do use him for resources quite a bit. Him and Comp, I think, are really the two heavy resource players on this team, but uh, Maorang, I think, looks really, really good in his role. You have Comp, like I said, at 80 carry. He comes in at number four in his position. That is a, a big change from where he was in my preseason rankings, where he was number 10. Uh, he has shown some things on Rogue that he, quite frankly, just never showed in any of his time in the LEC in the past on Vitality. He is actually mechanically, like, really, really, really good. Um, I don't know where that came from, because he wasn't always like that, but he certainly is now. His mechanics, especially his late-game teamfighting, have been really, really solid. Uh, it really helps this team have an identity later in the game, 
Because Malrang and Odoamne are both also very good at that point, especially Odoamne. It gives Rogue an identity of Rogue Time, which is the opposite of what they had last year, obviously, being really good early and then throwing away games. Now it really feels like if a game goes past 25 minutes, Rogue has got to be favored. Because they just play these late game team fights so, so well that they always have a chance to win. Because Comp is really good, Odoamne is really good, Larson's really good, we'll get to him. But uh, let's talk about Trimby first. I think Trimby is probably the weakest member of this team. In my opinion, not to say that Trimby's bad, just to say that he can sometimes get caught out. He uh, quite often will be a non-factor in their wins, um, which is fine. That's usually good for support, but I don't know. Just there are a lot of really good supports in the LEC, and I, I don't know if Trimby is like one of the top ones. I Again, I think of him very similar, maybe a little bit worse to how I view Malrang, where he's a player that if you put him on a good team, he will contribute and he will look good. Uh, but he's not going to be the type of player that's going to make a bad bot laner look phenomenal. I, I don't think he's ever really going to be that guy. Um, that's not to say he's not good, and he really synergizes well with comp here, but um, I think he's just below that, like, tier of support. He's right below Jung Hoon in my supports, that tier of supports that are, like, they can actively make your team better. Um, he's someone who I think can benefit off of the team being very good, but may not actively make them better on his own. And then there's Larson in the mid lane. Last talk about, I know he's really low on this list. He's at number six, but cut me some slack. Like we've already talked about VTO perks and Niski above him. You know Caps is above him and Humanoid should probably be above him. So oops, he falls at six. Like I, I don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry. I really wish I could put him higher because he's really good. But mid lane in the LEC is an absolute nightmare. So um, yeah, I, he's really, really good. He's really consistent. I think that's the thing with Larson is he very rarely has bad games. He very rarely has games where he is just, like, losing lane. And I know some people talk about, like, the whole, you know, consistent control mage kind of passive style with him. He can carry, too. He really is someone who does have the ability to put the team on his back. This team is just not at their best when Larson is the one with all the resources. Because I think there are some players on the team that kind of need resources to be a little more productive. Larson is just really, really good at not having resources as well. So... I want to give a big shout out to him. He's really good. He really unfortunately falls to number six here, but that is in no part due to him just like not being good. Uh, it really just is a testament to how good the mid laners in the LEC are. But overall, you probably wouldn't look at this and say that this team is better than Mad Lions or Vitality in terms of actual skill level, but the way that they play as a unit is so uncomparable to how especially Vitality plays. Um, they just, they get the most out of their players every single game. The fact that they can go into any game at around 20 minutes and they know that because, and I'll say this, uh, I haven't really talked about coaches and drafting, but it really is a difference maker for Rogue. They are the best drafting team in the West by far, one of the best in the world. They really consistently win drafts every week, uh, no matter who they play against. Um, and because they have that kind of confidence in their team compositions with the knowledge of after 20 or 25 minutes, they can just win games. Um, I really, like, they're gonna, they're gonna be higher than a lot of people expect, and that's why they end up here at number four. I don't think they're quite talented enough to break into that top three, which I think are, like, actual scary teams that are world's contenders. Um, I, I, I don't quite have them there right now, but would I be shocked if they broke into that group and made worlds by the end of the year? Absolutely not! This was the best team in spring's regular season for a reason, so... I don't know. Uh, for now, I have them just on the outskirts, but breaking into the top three is definitely attainable for this rogue roster. Now we get to move on to the top three in my power rankings, the three teams that I project to be going to Worlds from the LEC at least midway through summer here. Not midway, but partially through summer here. Coming in at number three, shocked a lot of people in the video when I announced this, but coming in at number three for me is going to be G2 Esports. The team that, yes, just won Spring Split and represented the LEC at MSI. They are at number three for me. Um, they really have not been hyper impressive so far in summer. But let's go ahead and get to their roster and then talk about where some of their flaws might come in. Uh, they've got Broken Blade in the top lane, Yankos in the jungle, Caps in the mid lane, Flacket at ADC, and then Targamas at support. This is a very good team. Do not get me wrong, there is a reason that they are above Rogue and they are above Mad Lions. It's because this team is still very, very talented. They have... Probably the best jungle mid duo that the West has ever seen, and Yankos and Caps. I can't think of a duo that is more 
like maybe not right now, but just, you know, Yankos Caps at as a duo is the best that the West has ever seen. And uh, they showed why in spring. Like, Caps especially is just ludicrous. It is unfair to have a player as good as Caps in the LEC because he's just that much better than everybody else. Um, reminds me a lot of how Knight plays in the LPL. Just very, very aggressive, but in a way where it's still, like, he doesn't have to win lane to win you the game, which is so unbelievable to say, but he can lose lane or, like, go even in lane. And then by 30 minutes, he has so much, like, so much pressure on the map just from being smarter and more mechanically talented than you that he will win you the game by himself. Like, Caps is just a different kind of player. You don't need me to tell you that. Everybody knows that at this point. Yankos is also still really good. I don't know whose bubble I'm bursting here by saying that, but Yankos is still really, really, really good. I have him as my number one jungler in EU. I still think he provides that kind of pressure. Obviously, Yankos' style is perfect to play with Caps. Caps is a very, I wouldn't say he's resource heavy because he can be low resource, but uh, you want the resources on Caps. And Yankos is probably the lowest resource star jungler in the region or it, you know, in the, in any region, I can't think of a lower resource star jungler in any region than Yankos, but, um, he does this so well of just being able to generate whatever lead he needs to on pretty much any lane that he needs to. He knows where he needs to be. He has great pathing. The one thing I struggle with him for is sometimes he's just not aggressive enough, uh, which is weird to say knowing Yankos' personality, but, uh, he can sometimes be a little bit too passive and try to play for late game. He can give up objectives and just say like, it's almost an ego play of saying like, oh, it doesn't matter if they get this dragon or it doesn't matter if they get this herald, we'll get something later. And sometimes that does come back to bite them. But I think overall, like he's still the best jungler this region has to offer. They're very, very happy with that duo. Uh, Broken Blade, let's talk about it. Um, someone who has been a little bit of, an, of, a, of a villain of the channel um, indirectly, like this was never my intention for Broken Blade, but... Every time I feel like I talk about him on this channel, I have 7,000 people in the comment section telling me how wrong I am. I was lower on Broken Blade for a really long time, and I think still, like, maybe consensus-wise, I am. I think he has shored up a lot of the weaknesses that he showed for a long time, including last year, all the time on TSM. I always saw Broken Blade as a player who was very good with resources and was very bad without resources. Not very bad, but just, he was someone where if you didn't give him a lot of resources and if you didn't invest in his lane, he could lose you games because he was always going to play like he had the gold and play like he could win any 1v1. I think he's definitely settled down quite a bit. He's learned how to play a little bit more weak side on this team. I think a lot of that is due to how aggressive Flacken and Targamas are in the bot lane. But some of that I think is just playing pro longer. Um, and it really has helped him a lot. He's still the same Broken Blade that if you give him resources, he can win you games by himself, especially on a lot of these Bruiser picks. But I feel like he doesn't get himself into trouble nearly as often when he's not being given those resources. So for me, he falls in at number three now. A very, very good player who has really got... G2 has really been able to get the best out of him. I think that any team has been able to get. And then you have the very young bot lane. You have Flacken and Targamas. Obviously, Targamas not like ridiculously young, but Flacken is. Um, Targamas is really good. He's very instinctive. He just has this sense of where he needs to be at any time that can sometimes get him in trouble, but can also sometimes really put G2 in a position that they shouldn't be in. He, uh, he, he, he's saved a lot of games for this team. His eyes for vision, I think, are, are extraordinary. He's probably the best ward placer in the region, whatever that means, but he just has a very good idea of where the enemy team is going to be, and, um, can make calls to take advantage of that. Um, he does get himself into trouble with that sometimes, because he can show up to where he, the enemy will be and be alone and just die. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I think he does a good job of maintaining his pressure. And then Flacken is a very mechanically talented AD carry that really does put himself into too many situations sometimes. Um, we've seen, especially recently, that he... I don't want to say he's the weak point of the team, but he sometimes can be a little over-aggressive, can get himself into situations, take 2v2s that he doesn't necessarily win. Um, and he also can be a little bit of a non-factor if he's not on certain champions in the late game. I'm not saying he's a bad player. I just don't know if he's the same level of world class that Yankos, Caps, Broken Blade, even Targamas to an extent, uh, can be. Um, and I think that, uh, we, we saw that get exposed a little bit at MSI when he was playing RNG. But, um, outside of that, I think everybody on this team is phenomenal. Like, you could really make a case that this is the best team in the region, but for me, they fall down here to number three. I think the two teams above him, above them, just have a little bit more of that X factor, a little bit more of that, like, go get him. 
Also, G2 just seems like the team to win, at, you know, to win LEC and then go to Worlds as the wild card and have to play through play-ins. Like, that just makes sense to me. And so, uh, not to say it's the only reason they're here at three. I do think the two teams above them are better, but I don't think it would be that crazy. I still think they're very good. Like I said, the best jungle mid duo in the region. A top laner who's really, really improved. And, and a bot lane that has the upside of any other bot lane in the entire region. There are games where Flacken and Targamas could beat anybody. They could beat the best bot lanes in the region any any given day. And I think that that kind of upside lets you into this top three and lets you truly believe to be a Worlds team, which which I do believe they are. All right, that brings us to our top two teams. I'm not really spoiling anything by putting these in because, you know, if you watched my video last week, you'll know who the top two teams are. But coming in at number two, we'll certainly tell you who number one is. Uh, number two for me is going to be Excel. Um, Excel looks phenomenal. This is a team that we've been waiting on for years to have this big breakout season, and they're finally having it. They look like one of the best teams in the world right now. Their macro is exquisite, but let's get to their roster. They've got Finn in the top lane, Marcoon in the jungle, Nuke Duck in the mid lane, Patrick at AD carry, and then Mickey X at support. Uh, this roster just clicks. Like, there's really no other way to put it. You wouldn't expect a team with two bottom, you know, half players in terms of positional listings in top and mid to be as good as they are, but it's not like Finn and Nuke Duck play like bottom half players. Like, Nuke Duck is the seventh rated mid laner. I mean, right below Larson and Humanoid for me, but, like, I don't know. Nuke Duck's phenomenal. Nuke Duck would be top three, top two, top one in the LCS, right? Like, it's just a ridiculously strong mid lane group uh, in the LEC, so I don't want that to take away from what Nuke Duck offers. He's just an incredibly good... He's, he's, a, he's a good mid laner. He's been playing way above his usual production so far this split. I'm not sure how much of that is sustainable. If it is, this team is easily top two. Like, if, if Nuke Duck can turn into, like, the fourth or the third or fourth best mid laner in the region, they have a chance of being, like, the best team in the region and winning finals. But until I get a little bit more consistent, I just need to see it from Nuke Duck because in the past he'll have these stretches and then he'll also go on stretches where he's just not very good. So hopefully he can maintain it. But really, if you want to talk about the reason that they're so high, let's talk about this bot lane. Um, I'm going to say it. This is, in my opinion, the best bot lane in Europe. There is a reason that this team is ranking so high. Patrick and Mickey are nuts. And I've, been ta I've, I've talked so much, so, 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 so much on this channel about how good Patrick is and about how underrated Patrick has been for so many years. He finally gets a top tier support to play alongside him. And boom, like best bot lane in the region. It, it was almost automatic. And I know Mickey is like really good. Like I don't want to take away from Mickey, but this shows that, you know, Patrick has that dog in him, if you will. Um, a phrase stolen from traditional sports there. Um, if, uh, he just wins games. Like, he just wins lane, and he just crushes team fights. He is the best team fighter in the West. Anybody, any position, does, like, I'll take anyone. I'll, I will take Patrick over anyone in that regard. He really does just win the game after a certain amount of time if he's on a champion that can do it. His Aphelios absolutely disgusting, really, really scary to play against. And Mickey is certainly not a weak link. Like, this is a former Worlds finalist, someone coming in who clearly has good synergy with Patrick and has made this team into the Worlds contender that they really are. Um, th this bot lane is unstoppable if they are on their A game. Even in lane, like, that's always been Patrick's weakness, has been laning phase. Even in lane, they are one of the hardest lanes to go into and then once you get to a certain amount of, like, a certain time in the game, uh, Patrick's just better than you. Period. End of story. Um, let's talk about the top side, though. I don't want to spend too much time on this bot lane. Uh, let's talk about Marcoon. Marcoon is awesome. He uh, was a great, great addition for this team. Him and Advienna obviously came up midway through last year, and they really showed that they were, you know, exceptional level players. Marcoon especially. Obviously, Advienna gets replaced here by Mickey, but... Marcoon is very quickly turned into one of the better junglers in the region. He's able to take over games. This is a very high resource jungler, but in a way that I think really benefits this team because Patrick and Mickey are going to win resource or no resource. Marcoon can really help out his solo lanes and get a lot of the gold. Like really, you can have Nuke Duck help funnel Marcoon. You can have Finn just be on an island. It's a strategy that's really worked out for them. And uh, Marcoon's mechanical ability is a big reason for that. Uh, he's just a phenomenal player. There's really nothing else to say. Uh, having him on a good team, I think, makes him look better. I'm, I'm not sure if he would look as good on a bad team, but 
really, that's not the circumstance we're in. They're on a very good team, so he looks like this. And then Finn is the weak side king. Like, we, we had a lot of question marks about Finn, obviously coming off of a year on CLG where he potentially was the worst player in LCS. Uh, he comes back here to the LEC, and he basically becomes exactly what he was before he left Rogue in the first place. And uh, he's a super stable top laner that doesn't die, but he's also not going to take over games. Like, he's the best possible version of Gen X, aggressive, ooh, irrelevant. Like, that, that style of player, he's the best possible version of that in the sense of you can throw almost anything at him and he will survive. We saw that already in summer. Um, but he also has the ability to be really successful in team fights. He is, uh, he's a really smart, instinctive team fighter. Uh, he's not perfect, certainly has some, some flaws. He's not the best with gold. He can sometimes get a little over-aggressive when he's ahead. But if he's playing from even, he's one of the best in the world. So, um, yeah, I, that, I, I have this Excel team rated really highly. Um, maybe by some of the numbers, you may not have expected that. But, I mean, looking at the talent on this team, they absolutely deserve it. The best bot lane in the region, a super stable mid laner that plays around his jungle nearly perfectly, and a jungler who can do really well with a ton of resources... Uh, and then a top laner who just doesn't lose. Like, he really just, he's allergic to losing. Um, this team is number two for a reason. Their outlook, their 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 ceiling is as high as number one. Like, they they could be an actual, like, world's semifinal level team. They have that kind of upside. I'm really hoping they get there, obviously, selfishly as an Excel fan. But even just objectively, I think that this team is 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 right there in the running with any other team in the region for being the best. Now, finally, jumping into our final team here, my number one team in my power rankings. And uh, if you're counting down, then you'll know who it is. Uh, some people were surprised by this, but for me, it's pretty obvious. Going to be Fnatic here at number one. This is just the most talented team in the region, and we will get to why that is, in my opinion, at least in a bit. We've got Wonder in the top lane, Razork in the jungle, Humanoid in the mid lane, Upset at AD Carry, and Hillisang at support. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about this bot lane first and foremost, because that is the strong, strong, strongest point of the map. Um, you, in my opinion, have the best AD carry in the region here in Upset. Um, you have one of the best supports in the region in Hillisang. You want to put him up against Kaiser and Mickey, uh, who were above him in my power rankings? Sure. Like, on Hillisang's best day, he's better than both of them. He's just not consistent enough for me to put him above both of them, but... When Hillisang's on, when he's having his day, he's better. He's the best support in the region, no question. Uh, and and that is why this team is ranked so high. Not only do they have arguably the best bot lane in the region, right? Because they do. Upset and Hillisang are great. I know I just talked about Patrick and Mickey being the best bot lane. That's because I think they're the most consistently best bot lane. But at their best, Upset and Hilly are the best bot lane in the region. Not only do they have that, but they have the best top laner in the region, which I think is a very deadly combination. Upset and Hilly paired with Wonder in the top lane, who is really, he struggled a bit in spring to find the form that he had on G2, but he's really coming into his own here in summer so far. If he can be the best top laner in the region, this team is scary because Wonder really doesn't need resources to take over. Neither does Upset. Humanoid does want resources, but, you know, give it to him. He can actually take them. Because you have two of the best players in the region, and both of them are some of the best team fighters in the region without even needing to be ahead. Very similar to what I talked about with Patrick. I don't think either of them are quite on Patrick's level, but Wonder and Upset are both phenomenal late game, whether or not they are ahead or not. Wonder just makes great team fighting decisions. He's a great split pusher. He's one. He's just the perfect top laner after 25 minutes. Some people are probably going to want Odo Omne above him. I prefer the Upside of Wonder. Uh, I think Wonder can take over a game a little more than Odo Omne can. Um, and that's why he's going to be above him for me. But I understand both of them are relatively similar. Um, and then, like I said, with Upset and Hilly, they're just going to win. Like, Hilly, Hilly just has those games that he's just going to win. Period. End of story. Sorry. Like, I, I, he's just going to win them. And Upset is probably the most consistent AD carry I've seen in a very, very long time. He just simply doesn't lose lane. Like, he just simply does not lose in that respect. So... A really strong trio there. And then you're adding on Razorg and Humanoid. Like, yes, this is like the quote-unquote weak point of the team, but both of them are high-level players. Uh, Razorg comes in at number four for me. I think there's a real case to be made that Malrang has been better than him. But for now, I'm going to keep Razorg above him. And then Humanoid at five, like, sorry, drop below Niski because you've been a little, you know, a little inconsistent so far this split. But, 
Like, number five is still not a bad ranking. Humanoid is an incredibly good player from ahead. He just can sometimes get a little too over-aggressive. We all know that. Humanoid dies to ganks more than any mid laner I've ever seen. That's just how he plays. He plays aggro. But if you support that with Razork and Hilly roaming across the map, like, Humanoid can win you games by himself. So I totally understand having him here in the mid lane. And he's honestly not a bad candidate for the resources for the reasons I mentioned before. Um, really, this team just as a unit, as a whole, is pretty unstoppable if they're on. That's really what it's about, is at their best, Fnatic is the best team in Europe. Very similar to how I view Team Liquid in North America, when they are playing their absolute best, I don't think there is any team in this region that can beat them. It's about that consistency. If they were to play at their best every single week, I would certainly have them here. I would certainly have them at number one. It would be such a no-brainer for me. But it's the fact that some weeks they show up and Hillisang sucks, and some weeks they show up and Humanoid dies to random ganks. And some weeks they show up and Razork isn't a good jungler. Like, you just have these moments where it's like, oh, come on. Like, we know you're better than this. Please, please, please help out. And so if they can just nail that down, and I think they're getting closer and closer every week, or at least they're playing like they're getting closer and closer every week. If they nail that down, this should be the team to beat in the LEC. Uh, that is my opinion at the very least. But yeah, just a wonderful collection of talent here. From Fnatic, a, a, a run that I, like a team that I could actually see genuinely making a run at a world championship. All right, that is going to do it for my midseason power rankings here in the mid of summer. Um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It certainly is, uh, these are fun to make. Just to give you a little update on my views, I know I talk about them a bit in the uh, review section, but this is just a, a more in-depth breakdown into how I view every single team. Up on your screen right now, you're going to be seeing the player rankings from 1 to 10 for every position. Um, and uh, if you have any disagreements, let me know down in the comment section below. You know I love chatting it up with you guys. You know I love having these conversations with you. That's one of the great things about videos like this is that, you know, my reviews and my analysis can be a little more factual. But this this is predictions. This is opinions. And we're going to have different opinions, and I love having conversations with you guys about your opinions down in the comments section below. So if you have something different, let me know. I'd love to chat. If you enjoyed the video, uh, please go ahead and leave a like. It really does help the channel out a ton, uh, especially with videos like this that we put a little bit more effort into. It would really, really help us out a lot if you did enjoy too. Just press that little thumbs up button. It's no skin off your back. Um, I don't usually shout this out on the channel, but... Uh, I kind of want to here. If you like my analysis and my opinions and everything and like the channel, obviously subscribe. But uh, also go follow me on Twitter. I tweet out LCS stuff all the time. Uh, LEC, you know, LA, I'm, I'm based in North America, so my time zones are a little messed up. But um, yeah, you know, if I find some you know good stuff on esports, I usually tweet that out. So if you're interested in that stuff, go give me a follow on Twitter. Um, I usually don't shut that out, but I figured I'd do it in a video like this. Um, but with that being said, that's going to be pretty much it. I hope you all are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day, and I will see you all later.